I'm recording. Okay. Uh, so, guys, you go back to uh, 1215, right? Magna Carta. And what, what does that mean, English translation? What? What's, what's Magna Carta mean in English? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought this was just general knowledge. Uh, I apologize. Uh, it means great charter. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I figured you'd study this at some point. It did say that. Knew that. Okay. It did. Yeah, it did say that. Uh, okay. So, great charter. Uh, what, guys, what we're seeing here, really what we're doing, starting in 1215, prior to 1215, you had absolutism. Okay. Like, absolute rule. Okay. The king does what he wants. Okay. If he wants to imprison you, he imprisons you. If he wants to tax you, he taxes you. He doesn't ask anybody, he just does it. His kingdom, he does what he wants. Or she, yes? Now, so you go in from absolutism twelve fourteen to seventeen seventy six. Okay, we're looking at like a five hundred year journey here. This is what your essays are. This five hundred year journey. Okay, and big part of that starts with the Magna Carta in 1215, and as you guys know, uh, King John the first was forced to sign this. Okay, did he want to sign it? No, but he signed it under pressure. Yes? Did he violate it ever? Yeah, I'm sure he did. Okay, but it was written in stone, like written on paper but for the first time a principle that we use for our government, and that is limited government. For the first time, limitations are placed on the king. And that's a big deal. It's a baby step here. Does this mean we have democracy in 2015? No. Okay. But over 500 years, we're going to see that move towards democracy, rule of the people. Okay. So. With the Magna Carta, if you look at that, uh, there were certain rights that were granted to the people under this Constitution, okay? Did anybody find free speech? I didn't see anybody have that. Freedom of religion, I saw some people had it and erased it, okay? Uh, but here's the thing. In 1215, there's only one church. What church is that? The Universal Catholic Church, which is Church in, right? There's no Protestants yet. When's the Protestant Reformation? 1500s. 1517. Okay. 1517. So we just celebrated the uh, 500th anniversary of it in 2017. Well, some of us celebrate. <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, a guy named Eric Metaskis. I think you guys know this guy. He wrote a book on the 500 anniversary. It's pretty good. Uh, anyhow. Um, so, guys, uh, in 1215, living in England, do you think there's anybody that's not Catholic? Like pagans and so forth? Or maybe like somebody that's Jewish, maybe living in England? I don't, I don't, you know. Jews were spread out. There had to be somebody that wasn't Catholic. You know what I mean? That didn't believe it. Did they have freedom of their own religion? Not really. Okay. The, the Catholic Church had freedom. I mean, they write about that in there a little bit, right? Yeah, the Catholic Church kind of run it. You know, them, them and the king. And, you know. So anyhow, there's not true uh, freedom of religion here. Okay. Uh, freedom of the press? No, didn't see that. Right to bear arms? No, didn't see that. Soldiers in your house? No, didn't see that. What about a reasonable search and seizure? Brent, you have that? Yeah, not like number 39. Did you write that down? 
Yeah, so it says, no free man shall be seized in prison, dispossessed, without lawful judgment of their peers, right? So you can, I mean, the government can take the property if they, you know, if you did something, you know, you pay your taxes on it or something like that. You get a jury of your peers, they can dispossess you. Okay. Uh, but otherwise, they can't. Okay, so that would be no unreasonable search and seizure. And then due process. Yeah, so guys, those of you, you may not be aware of this term. Just, guys, anytime any of us have an interaction with an agent of the government, that could be a police officer, could be an FBI agent, could be an IRS agent, could be an agent from the Environmental Protection Agency. Guys, you have a process. We all have a process that we are due. You guys have all heard of the Miranda rights, right? You have the right to remain, or is that what they start with? Yeah. That is in the Fifth Amendment. That's part of your due process. You have the right to an attorney, Fifth Amendment. Okay? Can't afford one, won't be appointed for you, right? Okay, these these are part of your the process you are due. Okay, and when they talk about a jur jury of your peers in here, that's due process. Yes? Everybody's with me? Okay, we'll, we'll dig into that a lot more over, as time goes by, due process. Okay. Trial by jury, yeah, that's in there, right? What about no excessive fines or bail? I don't have that one. No cruel punishment? I don't have that one. Right to petition? Now, if you look at 14, it says, and also to have a common council of the kingdom. It would be like advisors to the king, a common council. Do they get to petition? Do they petition on the behalf of all of us, of all the people? Are they just looking out for themselves if there is a common council? Uh, not explicitly a right to petition out here, okay? What about habeas corpus? Yes. All right, so in um, 1628, we're going to get the petition of right, not rights, petition of right, okay? And uh, you know the old story, uh, 1628, uh, we're going to get Charles I, and he's going to be forced to sign this. Does he want to sign it? No, but he's going to sign it. Is he going to violate it? Yes, and by 1628, England has changed religions, yes? Catholics are out, Protestants are in, Anglican Church, yes? And then um, Charles is going to violate some of this stuff. Uh, but one of the things it writes about in here, one of the concessions required by the monarch to obtain Parliament's approval rather than simply uh, nobles' approval before levying taxes. Okay, so that's an important one, right? You got, hey, you got to have approval from Parliament in order to tax. He didn't like that. He violated it. They cut off his head, right? 1649. Okay. Now, the petition of right, does it have a freedom of speech in there? Freedom of religion? No. Freedom of press? No. Right to bear arms? No. Soldiers in your house? Yes. Yeah, this is called quartering of soldiers. Okay. Uh, you know, soldiers uh, in a time of war or in a time of peace might need somewhere to sleep, somebody's food to eat. Uh, and they might show up to your house and say, we're going to stay here and sleep in your bed and eat your food. Can't do that. Okay. Can't do that. No. All right. What about unreasonable search and seizure? Definitely as an extension of the Magna Carta. Okay, that, we're not losing rights here. We're gaining rights as we go through this, okay? Uh, but you may see, um, you know, there's a, a, a number four. There's something about being disinherited, okay? That might be taken as a seizure uh, and so forth, okay? Due process? Yes. Trial by jury? Yes. No excess fines bail? No. Cruel punishment? No. 
Right to petition? No. Habeas corpus? Yes. Okay. So, um, then we moved to 1688. But before then, so when Charles lost his head in 1649, it went 11 years without a king. This is known as the long... Parliament. And the guy that kind of took over kind of became like a dictator. What was his name? You're studying English literature in our English classes. I'm used to you guys learning this stuff in English senior year. Oliver Cromwell. You guys ever heard of that dude? Okay, the long parliament, okay? And they're like, this isn't working out. We need a king. We gotta get back to this king thing. So, in 1660, they have restoration of the king. They bring King Charles II in. There's a problem with King Charles II. He doesn't have an heir. He doesn't have a son to the throne. He does have a brother. So the brother would be the heir. The brother is James II. What's wrong with James II? He's yeah. Catholic. So Charles II dies of natural causes. He didn't have to lose his head. And then James assumes the throne. And they tell James, listen, they pass what are called the, the edicts, Edict of Nantes. And they say to the king, James, we know you're Catholic, but none of your cabinet, none of your advisors are going to be allowed to be Catholic. And if you do have a son, you may not baptize him in a Catholic ceremony. So James has a son. And what's he do? Baptized in a Catholic ceremony. Well, the Puritans are in charge of Parliament. These are your fundamentals. These are your, your crazy, wacko, religious people. These Puritans, right? And they want his head. They want James, his head, on a platter. So what does James do? He runs where? Into the arms of France and Louis the Fourteenth, okay, and so James leaves. Now they don't have a king. They need a king, they think, and but and they want to have the bloodline, you know, the whole bloodline thing. And so there's this guy named William of Orange. Where's Orange? The Netherlands. If you ever watched the Olympics or FIFA World Cup, okay. The team that's always wearing orange is the Netherlands, okay? William of Orange, and he's married to Mary, Mary of Braganza, who was the daughter of James II from his first marriage that was annulled. So she's got the bloodline. So the parliament says to William, Mary, you want to come be our king? And they like William because you know who he hates? He hates the French. Okay, and he's got a good army. They're both Protestant, William and Mary. Perfect fit. All they have to do is sign this new document called the English Bill of Rights, and they can become king and queen. Okay, so they sign it. All right, which really restricts their power. Okay, so when we talk about this, guys, 1628, with the petition of right, and 1688, you get this. No. Right. I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. My flight got in pretty late. Eleven fifty. So on the text, I'm not going to make you list all of these rights in each of these documents, okay? You don't have time for that. Or do some of these rights bear mentioning in your essay? Sure. Do you have to list them all? No. These are major things. These are things that are adopted by our Constitution and our Declaration. Limited government coming from the Magna Carta, placing limits on the power of government, and then 
creating parliament that moves towards a democratic system, okay, of representative government. Okay. Those are important themes. All right, so when we look at the English, or excuse me, the, the English Bill of Rights, yes, okay, do we find freedom of speech? No, okay. Do we find freedom of religion? Now, do you have freedom of religion if you are Catholic? No, Catholics are persecuted. Yes? In England. Now, a couple of years ago, I was teaching this, and Mr. Swords overheard me. And he teaches world history. I don't. He said, Mr. Right. If you have the whole text of the English Bill of Rights, they do have a freedom of religion in there. It is written in there. Now, here's the thing. In 1776, in the Declaration, we had all men are created equal, right? But they weren't, right? You know what I mean? Like, so they did write freedom of religion in the English Bill of Rights. It was freedom of religion. You, you, you see what I'm saying? Okay. Now, today they have it, right? Britain has it, okay? Um, so it was in there, as was well the right to bear arms. Okay, was in the English in the English Bill of Rights as well. It's just not in the text I gave you. Okay, so you can mark those if you like. Okay, um, but press is not in any of the three, and either is speech. Okay, they're not. Those are unique to our Bill of Rights. Freedom of press and freedom of speech. Okay, um, no quartering of soldiers. Yes, as an extension, if and it's it might kind of be in there as well. Um, unreasonable search and seizure as an extension. Due process, yes. Trial by jury, yes. No excessive fines or bail, yes. No cruel and unusual punishment, yes. Right to petition, yes. Habeas corpus, yes, as an extension of the previous rule. Okay. Good? All right, so um, on your essay, guys, we're going to be talking. I'm not, I'm, the question asks this. It says, it says this. Explain the impact the following had on, on the foundation of our government, the English founding documents. Okay, so what, are, what else do we get from the English that we use to this day? And some of that, obviously, is our language, okay, but also layers of government. So we have counties. We have cities, we have states. We get that layering of government from the British, the layers of government. There's certain uh, terms uh, that we use, like uh, the county coroner. You guys know what a coroner does? They pick up the dead people. Sometimes they'll do autopsies if they're called for. Um, sheriff is a term we get from the British. Okay, so some of these... Uh, these terms and layers of government we get from the British as well. Okay, we adopted a lot of what they have. Okay. And these rights. Okay, these rights were really important to the early colonists. Okay, even though they weren't seen as British citizens, they were British subjects, and as such, they felt they had the rights laid out by these documents. Okay, as we're going to get into now. Okay. Um, everybody got 10 out of 10 on that. Good job. Does everybody have, still have 100% here? Okay. I'm looking at Friday for the objective portion of the test. How many of you guys are doing uh, freshman retreat? Okay. We're going to need to make that up. We'll take it early. It's up to you. Okay. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to wrap it up. Wednesday, we're going to watch a video, which is good. For this essay, help you reinforce a lot of stuff in your essay. You may want to take some notes on it, uh, on the video. Uh, Thursday will be a, a review day, so you guys will be gone. Uh, I can record a short thing for you on that, uh, what to expect. And then um, Friday we'll do the objective portion. Monday we'll write the essay. Okay. And if you guys, you know, I'll make... Make it up individually. Think about when's a good time for you to do that. Get you guys in here for that. Okay. 
Any questions? So I would start studying now, like looking over your notes this week, okay? Um, you said you watched the video from Thursday. I don't know if anybody else was going Thursday. I did lecture on the colonial era, and we got started on the revolutionary era, right? So the last thing you have is we were talking about Spanish-American War. No. <laughs> the French and Indian War. Sorry, I didn't mean it. French and Indian War, right? Okay. Yeah. So uh, we talked about the era of salutary neglect, okay, from roughly 1607 to 1760, 61. And that French and Indian War was uh, 1754 to 1761, okay? And that brings us to an important date, okay? Uh, and that is this date right here, because on the eve of that war, after George Washington like sparked this whole thing, this guy named Ben Franklin had an idea. 1754. Remember, remember what he had a plan. You guys remember any of this? It's called the Albany Plan. Of Union. They teach you this? No, I'm just speak. Uh, the uh, don't tread on the snake, or the uh, like the snake is like cut to pieces. Maybe he's got that flag. First, got that flag. Yeah, yeah. Did you get a Chris sandwich? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two. <laughs> Two for five. I forgot to get them. I didn't get them. So like, I did. We. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to my barber's thing. I was like, Dad, can you get your phone back? Got you got sausage ones? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Did you like it? I thought that's a pretty good breakfast sandwich. Let me try it now. Good for sandwich. Good for sandwich. Yeah. Uh, I didn't. We ate yesterday at this Cajun seafood restaurant for lunch before we went to the bunk. Unbelievable. I love it. Okay. Oh, black and red fish. My buddy and I split black and red fish. And you have the uh, crab crusted grouper. Oh, that is, sounds good though. Oh, oh, so we just like split ours in half and shared it because I, I wanted to order both. And then we had the grouper, uh, fried grouper type nuggets. <laughs> that was the best thing we ate. Boudin balls. You guys know, you guys know boudin is? Boudin. You don't know boudin is? Sounds like so it's got, got sausage, sausage, it's a sausage with rice and oh, uh, like gumbo or not? It's a well, gumbo's different, yeah. But yeah, you can put boudin in your gumbo, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I was full and I didn't eat the rest of the day, so. So, I mean, I had pretzels on the plane. Um, and then I saw so I was hungry this morning. So I ate breakfast. I'm going to skip brunch. The sandwich. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the main reason for this, guys, is for defensive purpose. Okay. As this war is breaking out, Franklin says, let's unify the 13 colonies into one. Okay. Now, how do you think the British would feel about these 13 independent colonies forming into one union? No. Harder to control, you know? Um, in fact, some of the colonies rejected this as well. Um, as people from South Carolina said, like, why would I trade a master in London for a master in New York? Does that make sense? Like, they didn't want to be told what to do by anybody, really. You know, it's that 150 years of self-governance, most part, you know, and uh, 
Yeah, they didn't want to trade Master. So this was rejected. But here's the thing, guys. 1754, they're talking about it. You understand? Like, this is being openly discussed and debated. you got to start somewhere, right? So, guys, getting all 13 colonies to agree to independence, guys, is going to be extremely difficult. Extremely difficult. So the, this is kind of where the discussion begins, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's why we talked about it. All right. Now, with this, guys, in 1760, the British had sent 20,000 regulars, troops over, their Navy, the Royal Navy. They're over here fighting. We're fighting alongside them, right? I said, you know, all the militias help and, and so forth. Well, guys, after four wars of empire, we've got British debt. They are going into debt. Now, if you look at this from the British perspective, you know, they send all this help over to protect us from the French and their native allies. Is it too much for them to ask for us to help out a little bit financially on this? Is that a big ask? So they impose a tax to do this. The first tax here is called the, the Stamp Act. So this is a tax on all printed material. Okay, so uh, contracts, newspapers, even like a deck of playing cards, those were printed. There's a tax on that, okay? Now, the colonists did not react well to this, okay? Because they didn't have a say, all right? And so there was a lot of opposition to this, just the idea of them taxing us, okay? So we get what's called the Stamp Act Congress. So a group of colonial men get together to discuss this issue. Now they want to do it in a respectable way to respond to the British that, you know, what you're doing here violates your constitution. Okay. And so they write a document called the Declaration of Okay, nobody said independence. That's good. Okay. If you're doing a regular class, you're going to get that. <laughs> Declaration. Oops. Declaration of. Rights. And. Grievances. Grievances. E-I-I-E. Yeah, but that sounds okay, right? No, E-I-E. I think it's E-I. No? No. Huh? I think it's E-I. I do, too. I think it's E-I. They don't look right. They must have Well, no, I'm expecting somebody to know. <laughs> It is I. Okay. All right. I'm four e words. Does anybody know who writes this? No. John. 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 John Adams writes this. Okay, they send this to the Parliament of the King, the Declaration. And, and what are they saying here? Taxation without representation. We just read an English petition of right that in order for the King to tax, you got to have permission of Parliament, right? Well, Parliament passed the Stamp Act. Well, but. We don't have anybody in Parliament. Now, if the British would have given each colony 
members in the parliament, we might still be British today. I'm sure we would have found some reason to get rid of the Lightnings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like the food's awful. We're not going to be part of you anymore. Yeah, like the cooked beef. No, they don't have the croissant, which the croissant, which is French. I don't think anyone in France says croissant. It's <laughs> <laughs> so American. <laughs> oh, they would be so offended by that. I love it. That's even a better reason to eat them. <laughs> Talk about eating uh, burger king. <laughs> yeah, we like burger king. You guys are so simple. That's right. We are. We'll kick your ass too. All right. <laughs> Okay. Uh, all right. So, guess what? This works. This works. They repealed the Stamp Act. We, we won, right? They still need money. So there's going to be new taxes. Yes. What are they going to start taxing? Sugar and. Right? You get these things called the Townsend Acts and these different taxes and so forth. And guys, we hate all of them. Okay, for the same reason, guys. It's you know they, we don't have a say in this. Okay, so a group of guys get together, and this is early on. So we're talking seventeen sixties. Okay, and it's a group that calls themselves the Committee. For the Committee of Correspondence. You guys know what correspondence is, right? When you write an email, you're a correspondent. Or better yet, write a letter. Correspondent. Send a thank you card. Thank you. Okay? It's correspondence. Yes? Okay. Now, there's some pretty interesting names in this group, this committee, okay? Like John Adams, his cousin, Samuel Adams. There's a guy named uh, John Hancock as part of this group. There's another guy named Thomas Payne, P-A-I-N-E. Thomas Payne is a member of this group. Ben Franklin is a member of this group. There's a youngster named Alex Ander, Alexander Hamilton. That's part of this group. Now, they are going to start a correspondence letter writing campaign to the Parliament and the King about these taxes. Okay. The British will largely ignore these. Okay. And so some of these men get very angry because the British are not listening to them. So over time, this committee of correspondence will morph into the Sons of Liberty. Now, the original Sons of Liberty, guys, does not include Ben Franklin or John Adams. Okay, these are more of your rabble rousers, your troublemakers. Okay, so yeah, Hancock, right? Sam Adams. Okay, they'll talk about these guys in the video, just like they're an odd couple. Hancock's one of the richest men in Boston. And Sam Adams is a tavern owner, you know, in the bowels of Boston. You know, I mean, it's like this, it's kind of this, nah, I wouldn't say low life character, but shady character. Sam is, okay. Uh, now, Thomas Paine will be a member of this, okay. Uh, 
There are others. Uh, Paul Revere, member of this guy. Um, so they'll become a little bit more radical. Okay. And they start doing some things. What time we get out? 15? Yeah. So they start doing some things like stockpiling weapons and powder, gunpowder, and, you know, having protests, you know, lashing out at the British, right? So it's a little bit more of a, you know, like I said, rabble-rousing group, resistance, okay? Not quite revolutionaries yet, but that'll come, all right? So... Got a few minutes. Let's just keep rolling. Okay. We're usually behind in here, and we're ahead right now. Okay, so. That's okay. 1770. Okay. Important date, 1770. By this time, guys, there are British soldiers on the streets of Boston. It's almost like an occupation of the city. And, you know, these Bostonians are, they're upset with the British. They don't like them being there. They don't like the taxes. And so one day, I mean, they were usually the soldiers, the British soldiers were, some treat them with kindness, but a lot of people, you know, would say nasty things to them. I mean, the, the nickname for the Redcoats were the Lobster Backs. Okay, that was a nickname for them. Um, and one fateful evening, in 1770, uh, a mob appeared and started throwing snowballs at the soldiers. Yes? Snowballs. Was it really snowballs? Now, guys, and they don't have paved roads yet, okay? So you guys live in the country. You guys know what gravel roads look like, you know. Well, in, in New England, guys, they would use uh, oyster shells, clam shells, because, you know, when it rains, it gets muddy and your horse and buggy gets stuck in the mud. So you crush the oyster shells and, and clam shells and you put them on the streets so you don't sink in the mud. OK, well, those snowballs had chunks of, you know, like oyster shells. OK, we we're just talking about Cajun food. Let's just keep talking about that for a second. Any of you guys ever had raw oysters? Do you like them? No. They're so good. <laughs> okay. What about crawfish? Yeah, I like yeah, crawfish. Yeah. Crawfish is good. Yeah. You ever had crawfish? No. <laughs> <laughs> they got a blue hook. Blue yeah. Hook has some good crawfish. Yeah. So it's Lily's graduation party. We did a crawfish board. Oh, really? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Anyhow, so the, the chunks of ice snowballs with oyster shells in them and so forth, they're throwing these at the lobster backs. Okay. They were actually throwing clubs as well. I mean, they were assaulting these troops. And so one of them got hit, opened fire. Next thing you know, nine people are shot. Five of them are going to die. Okay. This is known as Boston the Boston, Boston Massacre. Massacre. Okay. Uh, yeah, R E. Yeah. All right. Trivia. One of the five that was killed was a runaway slave. True. Remember his name? Crispus Atticus or Atticus? Okay. So, how are we going to respond to this? I'm just going to let this happen. Now, you guys, can you can you picture the painting of the Boston Massacre in your head? It's like in every textbook in America. You know what I mean? And, and who drew that? Painting. It's actually a lithograph originally. Yeah, Paul Revere painted this picture 
that was published in newspapers all across the colonies of British soldiers firing into a, into a crowd, right? It's propaganda, it's what it is, right? And they call it the Boston Massacre, okay? Boston blood had been spilled, okay? So the response to this is not going to be very good. It's going to start to turn people against the British, okay? Even in other colonies, okay? Now, these taxes, guys, and then the Townsend Acts that followed, mercantilism, telling, you know, telling us you can only buy English tea, these sorts of things, this starts to really affect the businessmen in the community, the guys that run ships and so forth, okay? What you're allowed to import from who, restrictions on commerce, okay? And so when you start hitting the pocketbook, guys, people pay attention and they start getting angry, okay? So we'll, uh, we'll follow up with that in 1773 with the Tea Party and get through uh, the First and Second Continental Congress and the battles of Lexington and Concord and all that tomorrow. Good?